So we're in this uh, little summer series that we've been doing for a little while on uh, asking some very provocative questions that have you know, raised a lot of questions uh, in and of itself. Matter of fact, it's raised more questions in me as I've been studying and preparing and getting ready. So I think uh, we're gonna continue over a little bit into August uh, with uh, some of these questions. And uh, we've looked at uh, what is the unpardonable sin. Uh, we've looked at uh, the matter of salvation. And today, uh, I wanna talk to you about something you think is so elementary but there is still much confusion about it here in America and much confusion about how important it is and uh, so many people are minimizing it. But I, I, wanna, I wanna ask the question, is baptism really necessary? Is it really necessary to be baptized? And the question really probably we wanna more narrow it is why must I be baptized? Why must I be baptized? If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans for a few minutes. Uh, Romans chapter number six and just kind of hold your spot there. There are a lot of baptisms in the New Testament. There is the baptism of suffering. Uh, there is the baptism of fire. Uh, the Bible talks about under the ministry of John the Baptist, the baptism of repentance. And then comes along the Christian baptism that did not occur until after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question, why should I be water baptized? Why experience that? You say, well, preacher, today your message is just all wet. Well... It may be, but why must I be baptized? Well, first of all, not in order to receive salvation. Not in order to receive salvation, not to remove sin and to grant salvation. The, the, the kind of views about baptism have raged in Christianity for the last several hundred years. Roman Catholicism insists that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Other views um, say that you are water baptized because you are saved. And matter of fact, that is the accurate view of baptism. Roman Catholicism uh, places baptism on the same level as a sacrament. Now that's not in scripture, but it is created by Catholicism early on in the seventh century. And here's what they would define, and I'll quote, a sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Jesus Christ to give inward grace. The purpose of sacraments is to sanctify human beings, unquote. Now, along comes a Roman Catholic scholar who writes a book and in the catechism of that book, uh, he asked the question, why is baptism the most important of the sacraments? And he answers it and I quote, because without it, no man can be saved, unquote. What are the effects of baptisms, he asks. Baptism imprints the soul with the indelible mark of the Christian. It washes away original sin, all personal sin, and all temporal and eternal punishment due to sin. It confers sanctifying grace, unquote. Now, not only does Roman Catholicism adhere to that teaching, there are some liberal Protestants, as a matter of fact, even some fundamental Protestants, uh, Protestants that would also hold to the teaching that somewhere, somehow, some way, baptism is a means to salvation and eradicates sin and grants to them eternal life. May I say to you this morning that no sacrament, no symbol, no sign 
can impart spiritual grace. The Bible teaches that salvation is in Jesus Christ and him alone. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, it is by grace are we saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, if it weren't for the free, undeserved, unmerited grace of almighty God, um, may I say no Christian would be sitting here today. Uh, we wouldn't be here, but praise the Lord for his grace and his mercy. Thank God in heaven that one day that he reached down to this undeserving, incongestible, slimy sinner like me and saved me and imputed his righteousness toward me. Hallelujah. That's grace. Because if we got what we deserved, the fact of the matter is we would have eternal damnation and humiliation forever and ever. But because of the grace of God, you are what you are, saved by his grace and his mercy. Acts chapter three and verse 19, the Bible says, repent and turn again that your sins be blotted out. So times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. In Acts chapter 10, verse 43, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness from his sins. It doesn't say everyone who is baptized receives forgiveness of sin, but everyone who believes. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Doesn't say anything at all about being baptized for the remission of sin. We have absolutely complicated through sacramentalism that which God has made simple through his grace and his mercy. You see, there's no outward plan, there is no outward right, there is no outward sign that can change a person's life. Jesus and Jesus alone saves. So this morning we come to dismiss the idea that baptism has any saving quality about it. Number two, uh, again, I hope you are, stay with me with the text and we'll get in there in just a second. Baptism pictures our identification with Christ. Our identification with Christ. Why should I be baptized? Uh, it is that God-ordained act that pictures, that symbolizes our relationship with Christ. It is not the reality. Now, my precious wife is in Phoenix, Arizona. Our son, and my daughter-in-law are celebrating 25 years of marriage. I, am, I, I, I got married when I was 14. And uh, so they, they're celebrating uh, 25 years and Kathy's gone out there uh, to take care of those Arizona grandkids. And uh, so she's not at home. But I have a picture of her on my phone. I pulled out my phone yesterday and there was her picture, the woman that I've been married to and loved for 48 years. Now that was not the reality, but it was just a symbol. It's just a picture. That is what baptism is. It points, as that picture did, points to the reality. Now Romans chapter six you understand it describes the way that we get into Christ is the way that we are baptized in him through spirit baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the Bible says by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Powerful word. So when you got saved, uh, the moment that you placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you were spiritually baptized into the body of Christ. You tracking with me? Just say amen. Let me know that you're out there just a little bit. All right. 
In Ephesians 1, 3, the Bible says that we are included in him in Christ. You who were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, the moment that you invited Jesus into your heart. Not only were you baptized into the body of Christ, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. You were immersed in Christ. And water baptism is nothing in the world but a picture of that reality. This morning, Jimmy Steele uh, walked up to the baptistry a few minutes ago, and Jimmy Steele stepped down into the water. Now, I want you to listen to the picture of what happened to Jimmy, what happens to everybody who is baptized. Romans chapter six, and uh, notice verse three. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So a person comes and they stand there at the top step getting ready to step in. Let me help you remind you, they've already been spiritually baptized, okay? So they step down into the water and they are lowered down into the water. It is a symbol of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We bring them back up out of the water. It is a symbol and a type of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're buried with Christ, they are raised with Christ. It is that outward act, that outward sign, that outward symbol of what has already taken place the moment that they were saved. You already have salvation, but water baptism, it mirrors to God, it mirrors to others, it mirrors to yourself, it mirrors to the world out there that you are identified with Christ. Now, we have a lot of missions work that go on in India. We have several missionaries that travel over there. And every year we see uh, a lot of Hindus come to faith in Christ. Now, here's the deal. When our missionaries go over there and they share the gospel and some of the Hindus get saved, their families don't really get bent out of shape about them uh, making uh, that verbal commitment. They, they don't get real bothered uh, when they repent of their sin and they invite Jesus to come into their heart and their life. They don't really get bothered. Let me tell you when they get bothered. They get bothered when they go down to the river and they experience water baptism. And all of a sudden, the families of those that are being baptized disown and disinherit their loved ones. Why did, what about their salvation did it, but that water baptism did it. Why is that? Because for the first time, they've been able to visually see what has already gone on in the hearts of their loved ones, and they can't deal with that. It is that outward sign. Now, I want you to look with me uh, to the book of Colossians a minute. Uh, Galatians, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and uh, go to chapter number two, if you will. Colossians two, it's nowhere else in the New Testament are you going to find uh, this teaching. In verse number 11, Paul does something here uh, that is absolutely remarkable. Watch this, verse 11. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the flesh, sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Now, Paul does an amazing thing here in that he parallels baptism and circumcision. A Jewish family would take their eight-day-old son down to the synagogue where they would perform an operation of cutting away the foreskin that would identify him as being Jew. Now, understand, he was a Jew long before that surgery, long before that operation, but that operation 
was an outward sign of who he had already been identified as. So Paul says baptism is the same thing uh, with the Christian in that it is identifying what has already been a reality. It is that outward sign. Now, uh, I've heard of some churches uh, that uh, they, they just will do baptism about any way that you want it done. Now, you can get baptized with a petal of roses if you want to. They will sprinkle you. They will dab you with a washcloth. Uh, they will steam you if you want to get steamed, I guess. I, I don't know. Uh, but it's not found anywhere in Scripture of sprinkling. It, it, it's just not there. The Bible talks about baptism being, and if you look at the definition of that Greek word, it means to dip, it means to immerse, it means to submerge, if you will. I D-double dog dare you, go look. You won't find anywhere in the Bible anything about infant baptism. It's not in there. You understand that infant baptism occurred in the 1300s in the Catholic Church when the Catholic Church around 1311 finally got permission and voted, if they would, to have infant baptisms. But so, so why are infants not baptized? Well, because they don't meet the prerequisites for salvation. What do you mean by that? Well, the Bible says that you have to hear the gospel. Well, a baby doesn't understand and grasp what the gospel is. The Bible says that you, in order to be saved, you have to repent of your sins. Well, a baby doesn't know about sin nor how to repent. And the Bible says that they have to turn from sin, place their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. A baby cannot do that, so they are not qualified for salvation. Thus, no baptism. You won't find it in the Bible. Baptism is an outward symbol and sign of our identification with Jesus. Now, let me give you number three. Why should I be baptized? Because baptism pictures for me cleansing and forgiveness. Now, notice the word I used. It pictures for me cleansing and forgiveness. Look with me, if you will, at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Simon Peter is preaching to the same people that had crucified Jesus. He called them a bunch of murderers, if you will. You can see the transformation in Simon Peter after Pentecost as he stood so boldly in front of the people declaring who they really were, the same ones that he had run away from and denied the Lord uh, just a few days before. So here he is preaching and he's identifying them as the ones who had nailed Jesus uh, to the cross. Now notice what he says in verse 38, chapter 2. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now there are a lot of people that take verse 38 and they will come on that word for for the forgiveness of sins, for the remission of sins, for salvation. And they'll say, see, see, there it says, there it says. But now get hold of something with me. Ladies and gentlemen, when you're studying the Bible, you cannot eisegete something. You can't lift it out of its context. If you're going to properly interpret scripture, you have to interpret it within the context of it. You have to interpret a word within the context of the sentence. You have to interpret the sentence in the context of the paragraph. The paragraph in the context of the chapter. The chapter in the context of the book. The book in the context of the whole Bible in order to accurately interpret what the word of God is teaching. This word for, unfortunately in the King James, is mistranslated. It doesn't mean what you think it means there. It's the Greek word E-I-S. It can be and often does occur translated for and rightfully so. But here it means because of. 
because of. How do you know that? Because nowhere else in any of Simon Peter's sermons will you ever see him saying that baptism is essential for salvation. Nowhere else in scripture will you discover such teaching. You can't settle it right here in that one word because it's not essential. By the way, if you go over to Hebrews chapter number 11 and you see that wonderful roll call of the saints of God, they were all from the Old Testament. By the way, none of them got baptized. You understand? None were. In Cornelius' house, they received the Holy Ghost before they were baptized in Acts chapter 10. Now, there's another troublesome verse in Acts chapter 22 that I wanna just help you with the defense of the gospel. In Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16. Acts 22, 16. Here's Ananias and Paul as they are confronting each other, okay? They're having a confrontation. It's a troublesome verse. Look what verse 16 says. Paul says to Ananias, now why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Now, a few minutes ago we baptized Jimmy Steele. That water up there is really good, clear, clean water. But ladies and gentlemen, there is not water cool enough, clean enough, clear enough to wash away anyone's sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So what does this passage really mean? Well, I promise you this, if it means that you could wash away your sin by getting in a baptistry, then you can wash away your own sin, and we know that that's not true. I love the way the Amplified Bible interprets this, much better than King James. He says, now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins by calling on his name. Folks, no person, no system, no symbol, no sacrament, no ordinance can take your sin away. Only Jesus can take away your sin. Now, let me help you one more, one more thing. Go back to verse 13. When Ananias is talking to Paul, notice in verse 13, he says, came unto me and stood and said unto me, brother Saul, how are, how are we brothers and sisters in Christ? In Christ. How are Brian and I brothers? We are brothers because Brian knows Jesus. I know Jesus. So when he gets up there in verse 13, he's already identifying, I'm your brother in Christ because I've had the same salvation experience that you've had. Ananias was already saved. So Paul is telling him, use that outward sign, that outward example, that outward symbol to show who you are in Christ. Number four, why should I be baptized? Because baptism pictures the covering of Christ. The covering of Christ. Go over to Galatians with me for just a minute in chapter number three. Galatians uh, chapter number three, you know, we studied this book uh, extensively a couple of years ago. In, in Galatians chapter three, notice verse 26. For you are all the children of God. How? By faith in Christ Jesus. Now, make no mistake about it. Mike Whitson is a faith preacher. Why is he a faith preacher? Because we have a faith gospel. I preach the gospel. And it's a faith gospel. You understand that the whole Reformation movement is centered around that very thought, that very idea that freed the church from the bondage of Catholicism, which was a works salvation. In verse 27, watch. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ 
have put on Christ. Wow. We, we, why, why should I be baptized? Because it pictures that covering of Christ. It doesn't mean we're not clothed with Christ until we are baptized, but what it does mean is that we are clothed with Christ and his righteousness the very moment that we placed our faith and our trust and believed in him, he imputed that righteousness. He covered us with himself the moment that we got saved. So that watery grave up there is a picture. That, that's why that we take the whole body under. That's why when somebody comes up out of that water, they are wet from the top of their head to the soles of uh, their feet with covered with that water to symbolize that we are clothed with Christ. By the way, as a believer, you're clothed already with Christ when you step into the water and you're clothed with him when you come up out of the water. The purpose of the water is to visualize that out, to picture it, to symbolize it for all of the world to see. Now, here's the question that drives me nuts. Can I be saved without being baptized? That drives me nuts. It's the wrong question. Asking the wrong thing. The right question is, now that I am saved, what hinders me from being baptized? And the answer is nothing. Nothing. If we want to picture the great covering of Jesus, we will go through that watery grave. Number five, and I'll close with this. Why should I be water baptized? Because baptism acknowledges the lordship of Jesus Christ. Acknowledges the lordship of Jesus Christ. Look, look at John chapter 8 for just a minute. John chapter number 8. And I want you to see verse 31. <clears throat> John chapter 8 verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. You, know, you, you want to know who's not a real phony? You want to know who's not a fake? All you have to do is to look at that person who is carrying out God's commands in his word. Who's obedient unto the Lord. In John chapter 14, just a few pages over, John chapter 14, verse 15, listen to the words of Christ. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. So why should I be water baptized? Well, it's out of respect for the lordship of Jesus himself. Why should I be baptized? Because Jesus commanded it. You see, when Jesus comes in, folks, he does come in as Savior, but he doesn't come in just as Savior. He comes in also as Lord, the owner, the operator of our life. We're under new management when he comes in. That's how we are supposed to accept Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior, keeping his commands. Now, it's a fact. It is a fact. I love you. It is a fact that I have deep, deep feelings of love for this congregation. And I, I love you personally. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. And the truth is, if you have believed in Jesus, if you have placed your faith in him, if you have surrendered your life to him as Lord and Savior of your life, then you don't have to, you don't have the right because you gave up your rights at that moment. You gave up any right at all at that moment. And you have no right to say no to anything that he has said yes about. 
You lost your right to say no the very moment that Jesus became your Lord and to anything that he commands. I watch this every week. Absolutely destroys me. It breaks my heart. But I watch it every week. I try to make uh, invitations as simple and as appealing uh, as I possibly can. And oftentimes, uh, I will lead the congregation in what's called the sinner's prayer. And when I finish leading in the sinner's prayer, I'll ask, and you've been here, you've seen it happen, I'll, I'll ask, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it with all of your heart, uh, I want you to open your eyes and I want you to look at me. And I'll go around and I'll, I'll look into the face of dozens of people who are looking at me. And I'll say, did you mean that prayer? And they'll shake their head. Yes, I meant that prayer. I invited Jesus in and I sincerely meant it with all my heart. I'll even go a step further sometimes and I'll say, are you ashamed of what you just prayed? And, 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 and folks will just shake their head. No, I'm, I'm not ashamed. I, I'm not ashamed. And I'll go a step further and I'll say, then I want you to identify with the body of Christ. And I want you to slip out of your pews and out of your seats and I want you to join me here at the front. And a lot of Sundays go by and nobody comes. Nobody responds. And you know, there's one reason and one reason only behind that. You know what that reason is? Pride. P-R-I-D-E. Pride. I know this for a fact, I'm not speculating. If you'll ever get to the point that you'll break that pride down and eliminate that pride from identifying with Christ, it'll be the most life-changing decision that you've ever made in your life. And your life is in for the ride that you have always wanted. God will transform you like you've never seen before. Invitation's gonna be a little different today not going to lead anybody in a sinner's prayer. Not going to ask anybody to join. Now, you're welcome to do both of those things. You're welcome to be saved. You're welcome to join the church. But the invitation is going to be like this. Because many of you that are sitting here today have never been scripturally baptized. In the Bible, baptism always follows salvation. Now, now some of you, um, some of you grew up Methodist and you were baptized in the Methodist church. Some of you were uh, Presbyterian and you were sprinkled in the Presbyterian church. Some of you grew up Lutheran and uh, you were sprinkled in a Lutheran church. Some of you may have grown up Anglican and, and were sprinkled in an Anglican church. And you say, I've been baptized. No, um, that method is tradition. It's not scripture. Today I'm going to ask all of you that have never been scripturally baptized by immersion after your salvation experience. By the way, let me, let me just go a little further. Uh, some of you got baptized by immersion, but later on you got saved. That baptism didn't mean a thing back there. You just went in a dry center and came out a wet one. Okay? That's all that meant. Scripture baptism always follows. And it is that sign I've been talking about all morning long. Symbol. Picture of what has already occurred in your life. So it's always following salvation. There are a lot of you sitting out here today that have not been scripturally baptized. And the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If I'm really Lord of your life, you won't have any problem saying yes to what I've said yes to. That's what God says. 
I believe if one or two of you come, there'll be a lot because there are a lot that need to make this right. So as soon as we stand, I want to ask you to just move to the nearest aisle. If you're in the balcony back there, just make your way to these stairs on either side and, and just come and join me like some did at the eight o'clock service. And say, you know what? I do love God and I, I, want, to, I want to show the world that I am His. And I want to show Him that I know that I'm His. And I want you to come and let's make this right today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would get glory right now in this invitation. For Jesus' sake, I pray. Amen.